My name is uh, Mats Berdahl, I'm a professor in the Department of War Studies, and it's a very great pleasure to welcome all of you out there uh, to this session dedicated to uh, an assessment or reassessment of the international intervention in Libya in 2011. And we're very fortunate to have with us today, also in the department, uh, Ian Martin, who is a senior visiting research fellow at King's, but who was also, of course, a special representative of the United Nations Secretary General for Libya and head of the UN support mission in Libya in 2011 and 2012. Um, to, after he has spoken, we are also very fortunate to have two very good discussants for this session. We have Matthew Preston, who's Deputy Head of Research Analysts in the, in the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And we have uh, Maul Friedbrad Heghammer from Norway, joining us from Oslo, from the Department of Political Science. Uh, and she was also, of course, a member of the Norwegian Board of Inquiry into Norway's uh, role and involvement in the Libya operation. You will have seen further details about our speakers on your invitation, so I'm not going to say much more. All I would like to add, though, is that we are going to do this, we are going to record this session, so be mindful of that when you pose your questions, but also we're going to do this on Chatham House rules. And Chatham House rules, just to remind you, means that you are free to use the information received in the course of this uh, uh, presentation and seminar, but neither the identity nor the affiliation of the speaker may be uh, revealed. And I think this is in order to make sure that we get a free and as open a discussion as possible. Uh, when it comes to asking questions, uh, please put your questions in the question and answer box and I will do my level best to, to get to all of them. And you can start obviously putting those questions up in the course of the presentation. So without further ado, I invite uh, Ian to, to present and, and thank him once again for agreeing to do this. Ian, the floor is yours. Thanks, Matt. Um, it's nice to be a visiting research fellow, although unfortunately uh, not much visiting going on uh, at the moment. Um, today is a good day to be thinking about Libya because today the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum is beginning in Tunisia, yet another attempt to work towards a real end to a conflict that's been going on for nearly 10 years, next February of course being the 10th anniversary uh, of the Libyan uprising. I'm not going to reflect on the full 10 years, nor am I going to say what should be done now. My own involvement with Libya uh, ended in 2012 after Libya's first uh, election. Um, but I do think that a re-examination uh, of the international intervention of 2011 with a lot more information uh, at least uh, that I wasn't aware of at the time now available and the immediate aftermath tells us something about how Libya got to where it is now and has some relevance to debates uh, past and future about international interventions. Um, I'm going to try to concentrate on aspects which I think have not been fully or correctly understood or sufficiently known uh, in what is becoming the conventional wisdom about Libya 2011. Uh, I'm going to try to give concise sort of personal answers to four rather big questions, uh, any of which we could discuss for quite a long time. First, was the intervention justified? Uh, how did it come about? Second, did NATO and the countries which intervened abuse the Security Council mandate to protect civilians by seeking regime change? Thirdly, was there ever a possibility of a negotiated political transition rather than a fight to the end? Uh, and fourth, was there a failure of realistic post-conflict planning? Uh, and if so, whose responsibility was that? So to begin with the question of, of was the intervention justified? Uh, these days, one sometimes hear uh, Iraq and Libya coupled together as cases of unjustified and failed Western interventionism. Um, one hears that from Russia and the UN Security Council quite often these days. But whatever one's judgment about either of the interventions, there is an absolutely fundamental difference. Uh, 
Um, Iraq was a gratuitous decision by, by Bush and Blair. Libya was a response to an uprising by Libyans themselves in the context uh, of well, what was then being called the Arab Spring. Uh, I can see no evidence of an intention to get rid of Gaddafi on the part of the countries that ended up intervening before the uprising. Indeed, the Western countries were in uh, quite a comfortable and today rather embarrassing intelligence relationship with Gaddafi's Libya. Uh, it was the uh, peaceful demonstrations, the violent repression of those demonstrations, the fact that that quickly turned into a civil war um, with appeals from Libyans for international intervention that posed the international community with a question as to what it should or shouldn't do. The response to that situation is uh, often told here, at least, as a kind of Sarkozy, Cameron, Obama story. Um, that doesn't, I think, take sufficient account of the early appeals that were by civil society across the Arab world, uh, nor in particular to the leading role of Arab states, uh, especially the Gulf states, especially Qatar, um, which uh, ensured that there was early response from the Gulf Cooperation Council, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the League of Arab States. But of course it was indeed France and the UK that took the lead at the, the UN, uh, first in uh, putting through a resolution 1970 that got unanimous support in the Security Council, um, throwing almost everything peaceful at Libya, financial sanctions, travel ban, arms embargo, referral to the International Criminal Court. Uh, and then when there was little response in terms of uh, checking uh, the, the violence, uh, began to table uh, a resolution to impose a no-fly zone, um, initially France and the UK, but quite crucially joined by Lebanon uh, after the League of Arab States had called for a no-fly zone. Uh, and the narrative then is that Cameron and Sarkozy convinced a reluctant Obama. Uh, and indeed it's true that uh, they tried to get the US to support a no-fly zone and met with initially great reluctance. But what I think the accounts uh, often omit uh, is that it was the US rather than the UK and France that was crucial in the form that the Security Council mandate actually took. Um, Obama was finally required to take a decision uh, with his administration very much divided as Gaddafi's forces came closer to uh, an attack on Benghazi. And we now have multiple accounts from those who are around the table in the US National Security Council as to how that final decision was made. And they're interesting, I think, because uh, uh, Obama began by asking how far Gaddafi was carrying out his attacks from the air to be told that that was negligible um, and then in quite an irritated way said a no-fly zone doesn't solve the problem so why is that the only option you're giving me um, uh, and he required that by the time he reconvened his National Security Council later that evening he had some real options uh, and it was then that he decided uh, that the US would target heavy weapons and ground forces of Gaddafi as well as enforce a no-fly zone if there was a Security Council mandate, if there was Arab participation, and if the Europeans eventually would carry the load. Uh, Bill Gates, the Defence Secretary, who was opposed to that intervention, uh, records that uh, Obama told him that it had been a 51-49 call for, for him um, and uh, maybe it's interesting today to recall that Joe Biden was one of those who were uh, with the, the, the military uh, was against that decision. Well that meant that then uh, the US, France and the UK together with Lebanon could get a Security Council majority. The abstentions of Russia and China from using their vetoes was crucial. So was the support of the African states on the council, uh, including uh, most significantly South Africa. That decision was taken in the context of warnings or claims that there would be a massacre in Benghazi. Um, and there's been a fair amount of re-examination uh, of how far those warnings were well-founded. Um, 
there's no doubt that there was a great deal of exaggeration. Uh, there was talk of genocide, which was never appropriate. There were overblown uh, comparisons with uh, Rwanda and Srebrenica. There was exaggeration by Al Jazeera uh, of the extent to which there were attacks from the air on, on demonstrators. But on the other hand, there was Gaddafi's own rhetoric, uh, his own human rights record, uh, his hatred of uh, Benghazi, and I think good reason to fear not genocide or massacres, but serious violations uh, had he taken Benghazi. Um, and although I say the uh, references to Rand and Srebrenica were overblown, it's quite striking when one reads the discussions um, as to the, how real those were in weighing on the policymakers. Uh, um, uh, certainly the Western policymakers, um, and I don't believe the fear of a massacre was a pretext, uh, to, uh, however far it may have been based on exaggerated uh, information. Uh, what is striking when one looks at the way the decision was taken is the lack of any medium or long-term thinking. Um, indeed, there wasn't, in my opinion, a strategy of regime change partly because the expectation was that Gaddafi would go quickly, uh, just as Ben Ali had gone quickly in Tunisia and Mubarak had gone quickly in, in Egypt. So little thought as to what would happen thereafter. So that's uh, an answer to the first question, my answer. The second question, did NATO and the intervening countries abuse the Security Council mandate? It was a very expansive Security Council mandate and it had one important qualification. It was a mandate to use all necessary measures to protect civilians and civilian populated areas under threat of attack while excluding a foreign occupation force of any form on any part of Libyan territory, which was uh, in there on the insistence of, uh, of Lebanon on behalf of the Arab states. Another example of how Iraq and Afghanistan uh, conditioned uh, people's mindsets. When France, the US, UK began military action, there was an immediate outcry claiming it went far beyond enforcement of a no-fly zone. Uh, so it did, um, but Susan Rice, the US permanent representative, quoted back what she had said in the Security Council about how we were not talking about a simple no-fly zone, um, but to take out Libyan air defences, heavy weapons, tanks, artillery, aircraft, and halt advancing columns of soldiers, and that's what they did. So then as NATO took on uh, what became uh, Operation Unified Protector, there were repeated statements uh, about the limitations of that operation by NATO spokespersons and by leaders of NATO countries. The objective, they said repeatedly, was not regime change, uh, Gaddafi was not a target. Um, there would be no military boots on the ground. Uh, the NATO interpreted the uh, reference to no foreign occupation force to mean that it would have no, uh, no military on the ground. There would be no communication with the rebels since the mandate was to protect civilians, not to support uh, the rebels in a civil war. Um, they, NATO did say that it would attack not only those Gaddafi forces that were threatening civilians, but also command centers and what they called second echelons. And very quickly, there was pressure, most notably from France and the UK, to expand the targeting. Um, France and the UK um, began to provide attack helicopters, uh, which could intervene much more effectively at lower altitudes. Uh, and as one follows the NATO operation, one can see NATO strikes moving from resisting attacks from Gaddafi forces to supporting uh, rebel advances. But beyond what NATO itself did, uh, I think the, the least known aspect of the campaign is the extent of bilateral operations of intervening countries outside the NATO operation. I think that included some air operations, probably mainly by, by France, uh, but it certainly involved very significant boots on the ground, uh, deployment of special forces. Uh, and one can now increasingly piece together from open sources the extent of what was a, a secret operation. Uh, the most significant deployments 
but by Qatar and the UAE, uh, the UK, France and Italy. Uh, they began in the East, uh, supporting the NTC, National Transitional Council there. Uh, but a key moment was when the stalemate of the war in the East resulted in a strategic decision to shift to the West. And uh, what was then done is described by David Cameron in his memoirs. He says this, with our allies, France, Qatar and the UAE, we ended up steering the ramshackle Libyan army from a secret cell in Paris providing weapons, support, and intelligence for the rebels planning an assault on Tripoli. Uh, and that secret operation cell in Paris uh, uh, was referred to, uh, at least in number 10 Downing Street, uh, as the operation of the Four Amigos, um, which has some irony in uh, uh, some of the later state of relations among those countries. The story of the arms supplies to the rebels is, is also a fairly complicated one. The main supplier was undoubtedly uh, Qatar, which is said to have supplied something like 20,000 tons of, uh, of weapons. Uh, the UK and the US stayed out, I think, on the basis of their own legal advice uh, from directly providing lethal uh, uh, weapons. Um, preferring to have it done, encouraging it to be done by Qatar and the UAE. France on one occasion did drop arms directly and told the United Nations that these were self-defense weapons for the civilian population. NATO stuck to its position uh, that it was having no direct communication with the rebels, but the special forces and the operation rooms that they set up with the rebels fed intelligence to NATO, so it increasingly coordinated airstrikes with the rebels as they advanced and the, the special forces involvement was crucial in ending the siege of Misrata and in the advance on Tripoli. Uh, and it continued, the NATO operation and the special forces involvement continued after the fall of Tripoli as the rebels advanced on, Gaddafi, on two remaining pro-Gaddafi strongholds, Bunny Walid and, and Sirt. Sirt of course is where uh, Gaddafi was eventually found to be, uh, and his fleeing convoy was hit by a US predator zone and two French uh, fighter jets, um, leaving Gaddafi to be murdered by fighters from Misrata. NATO maintained that it never went beyond the mandate of Resolution 1973. That assertion was supported by UN Secretary General Ban Ki moon, to whom under the resolution um, NATO was required to report. My own view is that one can only accept that if one accepts the argument that regime change was the only way of protecting civilians from Gaddafi. And even then, I don't believe that, that at the limit, the support uh, of uh, rebel advances, NTC advances into certain Bani Walid after Gaddafi's clear defeat could be justified in terms of protecting civilians and indeed by then the civilians who needed protecting uh, were probably pro-Gaddafi uh, populations. There was at least one significant massacre by, by the rebels of pro-Gaddafi people in Sirte. But whatever legality, and I'm not an international lawyer to pronounce on, on that, what is very clear is serious questions of accountability. Um, nobody can think that the Security Council would ever have authorised what actually occurred. Um, uh, NATO dutifully submitted the regular reports it was required to do, but they didn't allow any real scrutiny of the extent of its operations. The secret special forces operations were not notified to the UN, so they couldn't claim to be authorized by resolution 1973. And they raise, I think, important questions of domestic as well as international accountability. Um, because they're not subject, even when one looks at the, the House of Commons Select Committee, there's no frank account uh, of what uh, that operation actually was. Uh, the arms supplies were in breach of the arms embargo and began a contempt for the Security Council's arms embargo on Libya, which has continued to, to this day. Qatar flatly denied that it had provided arms and the UAE uh, failed to reply. So to move to the third question, could there have been a negotiated transition rather than a fight to the end? As the sort of seriousness of the situation that they faced was realized by the circles around Gaddafi, including his family, including his son, Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, 
there were a number of approaches to various governments, and it's very hard to know to what extent they represented Gaddafi himself. But there were three serious and sustained uh, mediation efforts. Uh, there was a UN special envoy, uh, Mr. Al Khatib, a former foreign minister of Jordan, appointed by Ban Ki moon. Uh, there was an AU, African Union, high level panel. Uh, uh, both of those efforts are well documented by reports of the Security Council and the African Peace and Security Council. Uh, and there was a much less well known, in fact, really rather little known and remarked upon Norwegian uh, mediation effort. They all started before the authorization of the use of force. Um, uh, but Gaddafi's refusal to pull back his forces left, I think, in reality, no real time for mediation before military action began. But a question which isn't asked enough, I think, is why, after showing their intent, uh, the uh, intervening countries, and, and preventing the attack on Benghazi, the interveners didn't then more seriously attempt diplomacy. Um, it's interesting that uh, 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 then General Sir David Richards, the UK Chief of Defence Staff, now Lord Richards, um, said in evidence to the House of Commons, and some of this is in his memoir as well, that he had tried to build into the military campaign checkpoints, he said, where politics could have reasserted itself. I felt that my political masters and those in America and Europe should at least have had an opportunity to pause, perhaps have a ceasefire and have another go at the political process. Um, but he says that didn't get much traction in London uh, and wasn't accepted by our allies, which I guess most obviously means France. It, it must be said that despite the Gaddafi regime saying that they accepted a ceasefire, they never stopped their attacks on Miserata and, and elsewhere. So far as the African Union high-level panel is concerned, uh, it was consisted of five heads of state, including perhaps most significantly Jacob Zuma of South Africa. They had gathered uh, and were poised to go to Tripoli uh, when the bombing began, uh, and they were furious when they were told that the imposition of no fly zone uh, meant that they could not proceed. So it was some time before they got to, to Tripoli. Um, I think the seriousness of the African Union effort has been underestimated, and I think it has been rather unfairly alleged to have wanted to rescue Gaddafi. Um, uh, in fact, they were the ones, particularly Zuma, who had the greatest chance of influencing Gaddafi to leave power. Um, but all efforts founded on Gaddafi's refusal to leave um, he would not leave certain motion of transition as a condition of a ceasefire uh, and the National Transitional Council would refuse to agree to a ceasefire uh, unless he had agreed to leave as, as part of it. So I think the question regarding whether there could have ever been a mediated outcome boils down in particular to the question as to if France, the UK and the US had put pressure on the National Transitional Council, while the AU and Russia, which did indeed weigh in to tell Gaddafi to, to go with the AU, uh, uh, if they put the maximum pressure on Gaddafi, was a negotiated transition possible? In fact, France and the UK were, although voicing support for UN efforts in the Security Council, were essentially dismissive and on some occasions even undermined uh, AU and, and UN uh, attempts. Uh, when the war seemed stalemated, uh, France and the UK did get interested in a negotiated outcome, at least a negotiated victory, and they largely used their own intelligence agencies. Um, and there were efforts to see if Gaddafi could be found somewhere in, to go into exile. Equatorial Guinea, which was outside the jurisdiction of the ICC, uh, was contacted by the DFID minister. Um, or whether he could stay uh, under guard in cert. But Gaddafi, I think, was always adamant he wouldn't go. And as a rebel victory became possible, then the interest of others in the mediated outcome went away. So we shall never know whether that was possible, just as we shall never know whether it would have led to a better long-term option for Libya.
So my fourth and final question, um, was there a failure of realistic post-conflict planning? And if so, whose responsibility was that? Um, one answer might be that it was my responsibility since I was uh, the UN Secretary General's advisor on post-conflict planning before I went to Tripoli on the fall of, of Tripoli. Uh, and some of you will recall Obama's uh, statement that while intervening in Libya, he said it had been the right thing to do failing to prepare for the aftermath of the ousting of Gaddafi was the worst mistake of his presidency, he said. Certainly true, as I've said, that there was no medium or long-term strategic thinking by the policymakers when the decisions to intervene were, were taken. Uh, it's also true that there was extremely limited understanding of, of Libya, um, a consequence in particular of the 40 years of isolation uh, under, under Gaddafi. Um, there was also a very strong determination uh, not to follow the, the path that the West had taken into Iraq and Afghanistan and become uh, responsible for what happened thereafter. So almost at the outset, uh, there was a decision that the United Nations would be responsible for uh, post-conflict uh, efforts. Um, I believe the UN took that seriously. Uh, we launched a process to try to understand where Libya had been under Gaddafi, what were the likely effects of the conflict, uh, what the post-conflict needs would be. We did that in conjunction with the World Bank, so far as the economic issues were concerned. We tried to draw on serious Libya expertise. Uh, we had, I must say, very limited knowledge of what at that point in 2011, how things were developing on the ground and what the consequences of that would, would be. In the UK, the responsibility was given to, to DFID, uh, which uh, established an international stabilisation task force, again, supposedly to apply the lessons of, uh, of Iraq and Afghanistan. It went and worked with the National Transitional Council in Benghazi, although it wasn't very well received by the NTC. Uh, it involved other countries, including Italy. Um, in the US, despite the view that this was to be mainly a European responsibility, they set up what they called a post-Q, they spelled Gaddafi with a Q, uh, post-Q high-level task force and did Pentagon tabletop exercises. The National Transitional Council itself um, designated a former World Bank official, Libyan World Bank official, as their de facto Minister of Reconstruction, and he chaired a Libyan stabilization team that operated out of the UAE, and those various efforts that I've referred to all interacted. But there were some very serious flaws in that. One flaw was that the external actors were over-convinced of the capacity of the Libyans, who were in many cases, very highly qualified people, but most of whom had been out of Libya in, uh, uh, in, in exile. Um, and the Libyans, as many of them uh, today will acknowledge, were over convinced of their own capacity and were fiercely resistant to a strong international role, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan uh, influencing things again. And that resistance applied in particular to boots on the ground, um, happy as they might have been to have had the special forces boots on the ground uh, to help them to victory. Uh, there was strong opposition to any kind of international military presence uh, thereafter, as, uh, as I can testify, because I had to, to talk to them about the possibility of military observers if a ceasefire had been arrived at. There are people who, in retrospect, say that uh, there should have been a big peacekeeping mission or international stabilization force, and that the intervening countries could have imposed that on the Libyans despite their reluctance. Um, I don't believe that myself. Uh, I don't believe anyone who was really in contact with the Libyans during that uh, period believed it, and certainly there was absolutely no interest or, or external willingness. The further inhibition is that, that Libya, while being institutionally extremely poor, was resource rich. So nobody was interested in allocating donor resources to, to Libya. Uh, and yet Libya was resistant to technical advice, uh, which it almost certainly needed. If there had been a more realistic recognition of that, then probably more could have been done for institutional development. But at the end of the day, 
the development of the capacity of government was not the central issue. The central issue on which things have founded ever since was the security sector, uh, and in particular, the proliferation of armed groups. Uh, Libya's first interim government made serious mistakes, uh, putting uh, armed groups, uh, all of them pretty much, on the payroll. Um, uh, but it's a very tough question as to say what could and should have been done. Uh, but what I do feel quite strongly is that the central responsibility was with the external actors who had built up those armed groups, uh, who had done so directly with the groups rather than outside any political chain of command, uh, who had done it in a way which sowed divisions, particularly between Qatar and the UAE, uh, supporting different groups. Um, and instead of the four amigos uh, and, and others coordinating uh, efforts as they had to oust Gaddafi, they failed to use their relationships with the armed groups that they had trained, armed, directed, to assist the new Libyan government to get them to stand down or integrate into the national army. And in the case of Qatar and the UAE in particular, they contributed and contribute to this day to a divided Libya. So nearly 10 years later, the legacy of 2011 remains. Um, and that question regarding armed groups is one of the central questions confronting the 75 Libyans who are meeting in Tunisia today. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Matt. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just pause straight on to Matt. You go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, both Ian and Matt. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, so, I mean, Matt has sort of introduced me. I, I, I just want to say a quick word before I start. I mean, look, I work for the British government. Um, I, work, I was working for the British government at the time and, and was involved to some degree, um, well, quite a significant degree, I suppose, in, in the Libyan situation in, in 2011 and thereafter. Um, I think the first thing to say, uh, just to sort of preface my remarks, is um, first of all, clearly I have to be sort of slightly cautious about what I say as a, as a government official, but I think more than that, um, an awful lot of what was going on at the time was extremely murky and very rushed. And I don't mean murky in the sense of um, uh, ill-intentioned, I just mean unclear. Um, we were operating in 2011 in sort of a period of high frenzy. Um, and I mean that both domestically and internationally, vis-a-vis um, -vis Libya and, and the wider region, which I'll come back to. Um, so while I've got a couple of perspectives on what went on in 2011 and sort of very much enjoyed Ian's presentation of it, my own view is, is necessarily partial um, from from where I sat in the in, in the situation because I only ever saw a piece I think you know only very very few people saw the whole piece and that's even within one government like the the British government let alone internationally um, so I think that's an important uh, important caveat um, I wanted to sort of draw out four areas myself actually most of which mirror Ian's points or Ian's headings um, uh, and in no particular order. I mean, let's jump in straight away, if we may, um, to the point about Gaddafi um, uh, and the, the question of intent. Um, I have never seen any suggestion of um, ill intent on the part of certainly any of the Western actors um, in Libya and not for me to ascribe Ill, Ill intent on, on, on Gulf actors or, other, or African, Sub-Saharan Africans either. Um, uh, I know a lot was made at the time and since about oil and prior relationships between Western governments and Gaddafi, both recently, but also going way back to the 1980s. But I never saw any of that in my involvement um, in the situation. What I saw was actually quite a straightforward situation of a crisis. And the key point for me is Gaddafi's rhetoric. Um, actually, I think what speared Gaddafi more than anything else was the rhetoric he used. And rhetoric which so mirrored that 
that people had become attuned to over Rwanda and had said never again. Um, and in some ways, I don't want to say it doesn't matter um, what he would have gone on and done, because you don't know at the time what he would have gone on and done, but his use of rhetoric of referring to the inhabitant, to rebels and inhabitants of Benghazi as cockroaches or rats um, uh, made it almost impossible for people not to react. Um, I don't think Ian mentioned explicitly the responsibility to protect um, in the context of Libya. Um, I'm always slightly cautious about um, ascribing the Libya intervention to the responsibility to protect as agreed at the World Summit in 2005. Um, but that strand of thinking and of that commitment to respond to atrocities, to threat explicitly threatened atrocities, um, particularly through the Security Council, which was done, um, I think uh, made it very, very difficult for the British government, for example, and I just mentioned that because that's where I work, um, not to respond to uh, not to respond to what was felt to be happening. Um, uh, that then leads into this question of negotiation. Um, I think one of, the, I mean, and this is maybe standing back a bit from Libya, but I think one of the fascinating things around um, the responsibility to protect the R2 debate, R2P debate to have is, well, what happens if you do an R2P intervention? And it was not something that you could discuss intergovernmentally because it was always too sensitive. But we had this problem is you're engaged now in an intervention to protect civilians at threat of, you know, that the four highest international crimes there are. And now you've got the question, oh, so do you negotiate with the perpetrator? Um, and I think the, the whole R2P debate, certainly then and possibly still now, um, hasn't quite come to terms with how you do this. Um, and so Ian referred to the idea of negotiated surrender I think that was on the table at various parts during 2011. But the idea of a genuine compromise solution that Gaddafi might have been happy with uh, or, or accepted reasonably uh, was, was, was frankly for the birds. It was simply not going to happen once the intervention was underway. So second point, the regional point. Um, and again, I would probably put a little bit more emphasis on this than, than Ian did. Um, the extent to which the Libyan uprising took place against the background, uh, well, more than background, the immediate background of uprisings in Tunisia and Egypt, and a sense that this was spreading across the Middle East. Um, now, it's easy to look back and say, well, that was a forlorn hope now. Um, but at the time, I don't think it was seen as that. And what there was seen very clearly was a sense that if we do not act, if we do not protect the Libyan rebellion, revolution, uh, movement, call it what you like, then this will be the end of the Arab Spring. We, by our failure to intervene, by our failure to, to act, will be setting the whole region back. Now, you, you can say that's justified, you can say that's unjustified, but that sense of not just, it's easy to, for, look at policymakers and go, well, you know, why, how could you do this? I think many of them were facing the question, how could we not do it? How, did we have any other option? And I think a lot of policymakers felt their options to a degree closed off. And I think we saw that again over Syria, of a sense that mm, we're not sure this is going to work, but if we fail to come to the aid of protesters of people standing up for civil rights, for democracy in the Arab world, if we fail to defend them when their own governments are shooting them, then we will be responsible to some degree for the end of the Arab Spring. And I think our, our politicians, our, our, our decision makers, were not prepared to do that. Third point, um, the UN Security Council. Um, and just a couple of reflections. I, I, got n nothing to contradict what Ian just said, but maybe just a couple of points that, are, that I would sort of add to it um, and of the dynamics. Um, from my perspective, and you know, I work on the UN in particular, 
Um, the initial intervention was marked by a sense of, how do I put this? Um, throw as many tools as we've got and see which of them stick. Um, we didn't know what was going to work. We didn't know what we would be able to agree. When you look at resolution 1970, for me, what's so interesting, so the, the initial resolution, uh, which condemned uh, what Gaddafi was doing, that imposed the arms embargo, the financial sanctions, uh, refer the situation to the International Criminal Court. Um, we, the UK, went into that assuming we were going to have a really tough negotiation. Uh, that Gaddafi had announced his intentions, he was marching on Benghazi, and we thought the Security Council was really important to take that to the Council, to do it very quickly, but uh, suspected, feared that we would have a really tough job getting anything through the Council. And what actually happened is we got it all through the Council. Um, and we got it all through the Council overnight, um, much to our surprise, to be perfectly honest. Um, and so what we ended up with right from the start was a jumble of measures that probably, well, on reflection, we've had cause to look back and go, ooh, not sure that was necessarily a good idea or done in that way. Um, but the Security Council is and was a very poor forum for managing this sort of intervention, not because it can't, but because its members didn't agree, or at least didn't agree enough. And I think for me, that's one of the really important points about the council and to understand about the council's response to the Libyan intervention uh, and to how we and others then use the Security Council. We had a Security Council whose divisions were extremely high um, on the back of, I mean, you can date it whenever you like, but certainly you can date it back to Kosovo through the Iraq intervention of 2003 and more during the later 2000s, where trust within the council was extremely low. And so repeating uh, a sort of a Bosnia-like, I mean, not that Bosnia was a great success, but nonetheless, a Bosnia-like situation where the council would oversee the international approach to intervention in Libya on a, on a regular basis, pass numerous resolutions, uh, increase the ratchet down on the people it decided were the perpetrators or were in the wrong was simply not possible in the Security Council of 2011. Um, and so when, uh, as Ian says, the Americans came in with, as they called it, no fly zone plus plus, and resolution 1973 was passed, um, it drew on existing council tropes around protection of civilians and existing council language around protecting civilians and all necessary measures, but tweaks. There was a very clear sense, I think, right from the beginning, that you weren't going to get any more out of the Security Council. Not because the Council was institutionally unable to, but politically unable to agree. And so it was clear right from the beginning that faced with a situation of an intervention that you've started, that you haven't got a very clear sense of where it's going to finish, under an authorization from a body that was almost never going to agree anything more, I think the intervening powers found themselves in a bit of a bind in terms of how do we manage the international dynamics of this. Um, and so I think what you saw was, to be fair, as Ian described it, um, which was a sense of, right, now we need to get this done. And different people took different views of what getting that done involved. Um, uh, but don't underestimate, I suppose is my key message, just how divided the council was right throughout this process and therefore how basically impossible that made it to have a consolidated international response. And the reasons for that were way beyond Libya. They weren't to do with Libya, to be honest. Um, although Libya then set in train more. Final point about post-conflict and, and post-conflict planning. Um, I think I agree with Ian. Um, uh, uh, I agree completely that capacity building was not the issue. Um, I think Ian and I probably describe the same problem in just slightly different ways. Uh, when he talks about the security uh, actors in Libya, I talk about the failure of outsiders, justified or unjustified, to broker a sustainable political settlement in Libya after um, Gaddafi's fall. 
Um, I think we're actually talking about the same thing, because when I talk about brokering a political settlement, I would involve in that the various armed actors involved in Libya by summer, autumn 2011. For me, they, they, they are political actors by definition. Um, but I think this is a problem writ large, and it is a problem that we and other international actors have never solved, is this, we, we've got as far as knowing that a sustainable political settlement that has enough people on the inside of the tent um, uh, is utterly key to effective intervention, whatever the motives of your intervention. But I think what we've not managed to get to is to work out how you achieve that, particularly after intervention. And so we talk about Libya, um, but for me, it's important not to talk about Libya in isolation. We can talk too, to a frankly significant degree, about Somalia or Mali or Afghanistan or Iraq. Um, even the more successful international invent interventions um, in Kosovo, in Central African Republic, in Bosnia to some degree, even as we're seeing in the news right now in Cote d'Ivoire, have massively struggled with this issue of if you use international forces under any, in any capacity, whether justified or unjustified, whether lawful or unlawful, it doesn't really matter because irrespective of how you do it, we have not solved the problem uh, of how you then, as outsiders, broker a situation where the local political security actors agree with each other enough on the trajectory of their country not to fall out and fight for power. And I would, I, I, for me, this is a timeless lesson. We've known this for a very long time. It's not unique to the post 9-11 era or the 21st century or anything like that. I think it's a very, very long standing. Um, and we have swung, we have oscillated back and forth between uh, the, the, the big footprint and the heavy footprint and the light footprint, as people were calling it in the, in the later 90s, early 2000s, between going in and doing an Iraq-style occupation to a, a much lighter footprint, no, we'll leave it to the locals to decide, and all sorts of things in between. And for me, this re remains the unsolved, the critical unsolved problem of international intervention is what happens afterwards because what we found, and I suppose this is my final point, is however much international resource, whether that's political resource, financial, military, you name it, into an international intervention, the locals have agency. I mean, quite rightly so, it's their country, but they have significant agency um, and the ability of outside actors to tell locals, to leverage locals, local actors into agreeing with each other has proved consistently very limited. And I would argue that's true of Western actors, it's true of non-Western actors, it's true wherever we've done it and in one, whatever capacity. And I'm afraid we're, we're rather seeing the consequences now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matt, terrific. I'll pass straight on to uh, Molfred. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be part um, of this conversation. Um, it's, it's an important moment to reflect on Libya and the lessons from Libya, and I've certainly enjoyed this very insightful uh, discussion. What I would like to do is to highlight some of the dilemmas that have, I think, uh, emerged in the comments already and that I've thought a fair bit about when it comes to Libya and lessons from Libya, and lessons that, as we've heard, were not necessarily unique to, to this context, but are dilemmas that we may well um, face again, and to take this opportunity to try and learn some lessons uh, from the particular context of, um, of Libya. So starting with, um, with the first cluster, or the first dilemma, um, relating to this, to the mandate and the interpretation of the mandate and, the, and its scope. It was clear fairly early on that regime change would be uh, almost an inevitably, an inevitable consequence of the, um, of the intervention of the coalition. It wasn't, however, clear uh, what kind of regime change that would be. And um, it seems to me that one of the 
perhaps missed opportunities in uh, the political track uh, associated with the Libya intervention was to think more, to take more time, to think more carefully through those different options um, in the course of, of the spring and, and summer of 2011. And as we heard in, um, in the first presentation, there was also this issue of um, the NATO operations on the one hand, and then these bilateral operations, if you like, on the other hand, which points to the first uh, dilemma, uh, which for a smaller uh, partner in a coalition along these lines, how do you handle uh, that, uh, that problem where you're engaged in one operation and yet your coalition partners may be engaged in activities that go beyond your own interpretation of that mandate. So I, I, it seems to me that particular dilemma uh, is one to, uh, to take out of the Libyan context and, and think carefully about for the future. The second cluster... You got mail. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Um, so the second cluster of issues um, I wanted to address in my comments uh, was this lack of medium or long-term thinking, uh, which I very much agree with as a diagnosis of, of where we were uh, in 2011. And it's clear to me at least that there was a general underestimation of the duration um, of the operations from the, from the outset, that there was an underestimation of the post-conflict difficulties as we've heard. And it also seems to me that there was a pulverization of um, ownership and responsibility uh, towards the end of the military phase uh, when it came to preparing for the post-conflict uh, situation. Um, from the perspective of uh, smaller members of this intervention, this coalition, it seems that there was a clear sort of uh, lack of enthusiasm for um, among the main protagonists of the military phase to take the lead and take ownership perhaps of the preparations for the post-conflict phase. Um, I would say that it seems to me that the political track was very much underdeveloped compared with the military track of this operation and that this I think is an issue that deserves a bit more attention. There has been a, f a lot of attention and deservedly so to the military campaign and how it was conducted and the role of these um, bilateral operations. Um, but I do think that the, uh, the lack of perhaps momentum or investment in the political track uh, in the course of this is something that also deserves more attention um, as a lost opportunity. Um, the third issue or the cluster of issues relates to what we, we just heard from, uh, from our colleagues regarding the post-conflict preparation. Um, how to prepare for this um, and the sort of the critical problems that uh, often emerge in these kinds of settings regarding preparing for the post-conflict and how to, um, how to engage with local partners and stakeholders. I think it comes through quite clearly in the Libyan context that there more could have been done by international partners to, uh, to engage local stakeholders and set certain expectations beyond what happened. Of course, there, there is always um, a difficult perhaps or a balancing act uh, that we have to take into uh, consideration in, in preparing for these local stakeholders to take more ownership, etc. It doesn't mean that it's impossible to place certain expectations or requirements in place, it seems to me that perhaps several Libyan stakeholders would have appreciated that. So I think I'll round it off uh, with those three dilemmas that come out of the, uh, the Libyan context. And perhaps also to say that I think it's, it's an important exercise to, uh, to revisit this case. And also perhaps to remind ourselves that we um, we don't often think about the counterfactuals uh, in the scenario uh, regarding other kinds of uh, regime change or regime transitions that could have happened in the process. 
uh, but also the counterfactual of not having intervened at all. And um, I think that this is an important part of what we need to discuss when we talk about Libya in 2011. So thank you again. Um, I think I'll leave it there.